next uh, event in the third of the three-part series. Liz, did you make me presenter? There we go. Okay, briefly the agenda. Uh, we'll talk about what's important, how is omnichannel going to impact, or what's, what should be important to your distribution operations when designing pick, a picking system. Um, we're going to talk about how to plan for that the things to consider, um, the things to ask of your business, really. They're some of the, the highlight of some of the most important issues. Then when we get, then we'll, so we'll talk about, you know, all the things you need to know to design or redesign a fulfillment system. And then we'll get into the order picking. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about something that I like to call start at the end methodology. We will address retail and direct to consumer order picking in low, medium, and high volume situations. Um, and as I said, we will we will address some things in packing and shipping. Here is something uh, I ran across. Uh, at the last minute, and it has some really, these are, um, are two different, actually four different surveys, some great statistics. Um, eMarketer says that next year, global business to consumer shipments will rise almost 18%. Um, you know, we've been hearing Alibaba is coming. Um, it's here, and you know it, it's a global direct-to-consumer marketplace now. Nielsen says 50% of U.S. smartphone owners are using shopping apps every month, and Booz and Company says 40% of shoppers are showrooming. That, if they're ordering when they're showrooming, that affects us. Uh, UPS and Comscore, they've got some great statistics here. Forty-four percent of people are likely to shop a retailer. They're more likely to shop a retailer if they can buy online and pick up in their store. So, you know, that tells you almost half of the people want a store shipment of a consumer order. Sixty-two percent want the ability to buy online and return the items to a store. So whether they pick it up at the store or not, they want to return it to the store. We're going to talk about that because that poses some problems and some opportunities. 44% of online shoppers abandon shopping carts due to the estimated delivery time. Um, this is going to become, you know, we, we know that some some companies are doing same-day shipments. Uh, Google, has, Google Express just launched about a month ago, so Amazon is not the only one in same-day delivery. eBay is doing it also. So our time to process orders is shortening. 78% pick the cheapest delivery. The highest percentage is the three to five day. So we're going to talk about freight not inconsequential. And 8% of online shoppers are speedy. So 8%, almost 10, want their delivery in less than three days. Um, you know, we've been through all the channels and where you can get things and give things and all of that. But what it means is it's changing. This graphic shows, what, eight, um, eight different channels. Well, I think what is for sure is that in another year or two or three, these won't be the same channels. They will change. They may increase. They may decrease, but change. So that means when we, when we design a picking system, we need to be flexible. 
Okay, the planning and uh, the planning portion. I'm not going to dwell on inventory long at all. I am going to, and the reason is, inventory is an ERP WMS strategic business issue. Um, it's not really something that we drive uh, uh, on a large scale as as executing order fulfillment. Um, but it's very important. Remember, half of the people want to order and pick up at a store. So that means we have to be able to um, they want to know where you have your inventory. They want to know what's in your store. If you have multiple stores, they want to know what's in each each store. They want to know what you have in your DC. They want to know how long it's going to take to get it from either one of the places. Um, and this is a little bit of an old graphic. It shows a dedicated um, retail and e-commerce DCs. But what you see are all the places beyond your DC that you want to have visibility to your, to your inventory. And I think that's the, the word, is visibility and real-time updates. And then after the consumer orders it, they want to know where it is every step. Um, I bought something on eBay the other day. And it was shipped uh, United States parcel or United States U.S. Postal Service, and the Postal Service now has a step-by-step -step tracking system. So I watched it go from Washington to um, from Washington to the Lehigh Valley, and they updated me along the way. I must have gotten eight emails on it. Parcel freight. Um, this is not an inconsequential des uh, quantity in your budgets, and it's about to become a larger portion of your budgets. Uh, if you're not aware, both UPS and FedEx will be implementing dimensional weight charges um, January 1 on all parcels. Now. This is an example. It's a little bit of a larger parcel, 20, 24 by 18 by 13. It costs by weight, or I'm sorry, yeah, by weight, it costs $18. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. 24 by 18 by 13 is $27. If you can reduce that package size one inch in each dimension, you can reduce the weight charge by $8.91 per parcel. Um, if you do just 50 of these orders a day, that's $111,000 a year. It's actually more than that because a carton this size at 20 pounds is going to get hit with a dim weight. Here's something from the Postal Service themselves. They kind of break it down a little easier to understand. A package of men's sneakers um, by weight is $8.05. By dimension, it goes up 13%. Now, the next two, a kid's backpack and a toy truck, they're things that tend to be big. But the... Um, the product that kind of caught my attention was a toaster. And assuming that this is just a pop-up toaster, yeah, it doesn't weigh much, but it's also not very large. That has a 35% increase when it's dim-weighted. So um, that, that's, we need to keep this in mind. We need to keep this in mind when we decide how to pack things and how to ship things. Okay, so we've identified some of the things we need to know. 
now we need to know your your businesses you need to know your businesses strategic issues and you need to know first of all just about everyone with a retail store should be using it in this strategy but are you going to ship from store at all if you are and let's say you're a, a, a large chain, you have 500, 800 stores, are you going to ship from every store? Or are you going to ship from regional or metro, one store in each metro area? Um, is that going to be your primary location to ship from? Or is that going to be a secondary location to ship from? You know, it may affect the number and quantity of SKUs that you keep in your stores. That's actually good news for your retail orders because they get larger. Now, what happens if the company wants to replenish those stores more frequently because they're pulling product out of them more frequently? That could be bad news for the supply chain. So we have to understand exactly how the company wants to get product to the consumer, okay? Um, when you ship to store, are they going to pull it out of their inventory? Or are you just going to pack it like a or pick it and pack it like a restock order? Or do you have to pack it as a consumer order separately? And then we'll address getting that with the rest of the order. We talked, I mentioned returns earlier. Um, returns are always the stepchild. No one likes them. Um, in fact, if you don't do any ship to or return to store and you start to do it, you have um, a great opportunity or possible uh, uh, additional costs that you're going to end up with. When someone returns something to a store, um, it makes sense to me the opportunity is to be able to resell that faster and cheaper than when they returned it to your DC. Now you need the systems to recognize this, you need the processes at the store to QC what comes back and if it's resellable. Um, you need the ability to know if you need it in that store or do you need it in another store? And does it make sense to ship it from store to store? I don't think that it makes sense to return all returns to the DC unless you already have product coming back and it can get on board there. Um, it's an additional cost if you do. If, or if, if you don't have that, that lane filled already. So there are things we need to under, you want to understand because it's going to drive costs. It's going to drive where your inventory is. And I'll tell you, if you don't handle this right, it will drive your inventory up. We also need to know what service levels we're going to have to commit to. Shipment and delivery. Do we have to do same day? Does ever, do we have to do next day, um, two day, and so on? You know, is, is, does everything go under that? Or my guess is most everyone is going to follow Amazon. And if I go for the low price, I'll go for two to five day or five to seven day delivery. Um, very important is your freight pricing policy. Some companies give freight away. Some do not. We need to, you want to know that. Um, and then your fulfillment window, meaning what time do you take orders until to ship same or next day? And really what we're trying to address here is, not address, but what you want to be able to wait to pull orders, same day orders down as late in the day as possible. The more orders you can process at one time, the more efficiently you can process them. Sorry about that. Something happened. So 
then we're going to quantify, we need to quantify the channels. So in retail, are you, are you going to be a push or a pull or a combination of them? Um, I'm going to take a, an opportunity to talk about here. If you do ship from store, you know, it, we need to, you want to know if that is going to affect, if you're going to ship from store tomorrow, is that going to make your store replenishment orders different from today? Um, are your, you know, are your order profiles going to change? Because you may want to pick orders differently if your uh, number of SKUs goes up, but your num total number of units go down, as opposed to the opposite. Um, and then for store pickups, um, it would be real nice to be able to just include that in the retail restock order, but you may have to pack it for the consumer. And then we talked about returns. Um, direct to consumer. What, if you're a high value business, there may be things that you do differently. You may put handwritten notes in. You may provide free gift wrapping, um, special promotional things. This all affects completing that order. If you're drop shipping, you have to define the rules of your contract with your customer that you're drop shipping for. Um, who picks the carrier? Who pays the freight? And what are those implications? Wholesale, for, for this webinar, we're going to consider whole, wholesale orders at least similar to retail. Um, if you're a manufacturer, you may have higher quantity uh, orders that are case picks and pallet picks, but that generally is easier to deal with than split case order fulfillment that we're addressing here. So the picking itself. I talked about earlier the start at the end methodology. Um, put a little graphic up here to just kind of illustrate it. In a larger, we'll say typical operation, the products will vary enough that they'll be product that can run through, and this is assuming a relatively high volume, and we'll define high and low volumes in the upcoming slides, but um, it's going to have, for sake of argument, three different types of packing. An automated packing, basically something where you uh, take the consolidated order and put it onto or into a machine and it comes out ready to ship. Semi-automated is where it's not 100% automatic, but it is faster than manual. And in most operations, the product varies enough that there's almost always a need for manual packing, either because of things like gift wrapping or f fragile products that need special packing considerations that can't be addressed in automated and semi-automated packing. Um, so when we have multiple pack operation or pack method methods, um, excuse me one moment. We always want to reduce the amount of time to pick an order. That generally translates into reducing the walking time per order. We also want to reduce touches. Um, this graphic, again, shows that we've got three different pack methodologies coming from three different pick areas. The one way that we help cut down the order time is we break the order up. In a retail order that's not a push, we'll talk about push and pull in a little bit, that's, that's in a pull type of, of scenario, you are probably going to have 
uh, order lines that come from slow, medium, and fast movers. The way to become more efficient is to break that order down into three separate segments. Reason being, if you have a couple of slow movers in an order, you can pick many orders at one time in your slow moving area. In the fast mover moving area, you would handle that differently. Same as sometimes medium movers are handled differently. Now, when we've got, when we've broken, if it makes sense to break the order up, we have to get the order back together. And that's what we call consolidation. And that can be done either manually or automatically. Okay? So the first thing we do is we recognize how does this particular order or this group of orders want to be packed? Then, and then there's other criteria for creating a wave. Um, retail orders, typically we can get between 500 and 200 orders in a wave. Direct to consumer, because they're smaller orders, um, we can get from between 50 and 500 orders in a wave. Um, 50 when it's larger product, but 500 if it tends to be smaller things like bagged apparel and, and the like. Um, we batch them together, as I said, by pack type. We also want to look at commonality of SKUs. So we can get, when we, when we take the time to travel to a location, we can get more units when we stop there. Um, you may break orders into departments also. If you're filling for a, um, a department store or even possibly your own store, you may, um, you may want to break the order down into separate containers when it goes to the store so they can get it on the shelf faster. So we need to know that. OK. Um, as much as we're going to talk about new technology, I thought it was a good idea to bring back some old technology. Um, first thing we're going to talk about in order picking is for retail, what I'll call push. It tends to be apparel and similar type product where if you buy 10,000 blue shirts, um, you're going to do an allocation and you're going to distribute either 9,000 of them or maybe all of them. You may keep 10% back to restock. And you're going to decide, three, you know, every A store is going to get three, B store is going to get two, and a C store is going to get one. When those allocations are done and we do a push to them, this is called a rapid pack system. Um, I don't know when it was created, but it has been around at least 20 years, if not 30 or 40 years. And it is one of the first goods to person. What you have here is SKUs coming in to the order filler. You have on either uh, in the rapid pack, this is an indexing belt conveyor. So we'll index five, eight, or 10 orders into a zone at a time. And usually when you do a push, it's 85% or more of your orders get one of each SKU. So they come into this zone. We grab all the whites for the five orders in here and distribute them accordingly. This is typically done with either voice, RF, or uh, can be done with put to light. What Rapid Pack is very good for, Rapid Pack is a relatively low capital cost if for apparel. It's easy to handle both hanging goods and flat goods, also hard goods. So it is very, very flexible. You can put one person in a very large zone. You can put three, four, five people in one of these zones, depending upon your throughput that you need. It can be very, very productive, five to 1,200 units per hour per person. Depends on the size of the product, depends on, on the number of units that are being uh, distributed to each order or being distributed at each, uh, uh, each batch of orders, but very productive. A more traditional um, retail push system is what I call a traditional put system. Um, this is a photo. This is an apparel 
chain and skew cartons are staged up on one line of gravity, they go this way. The other line of gravity adjacent to the, the store cartons are stacked too high. And they open one, two, three cartons at a time. They scan them in their zone. This is done with light so that you scan the skew. It tells you in your zone the quantity to put in each store cart. Um, these are a little less uh, productive than Rapid Pack. The reason is Rapid Pack allows people to stay in a much smaller area. These pick lines are usually between 50 and 100 feet long. These zones are 8, 10, 15 feet. So there's much less walking. These are very scalable. Rapid Pack is not quite as scalable. Um, they're a little bit more flexible, so the put system is a little bit more flexible in its scalability. Okay. In a retail push, um, if we break things down into waves, we can do things. Th this would be in a, in a more medium to higher speed operation. very high speed operation. When we're very high in a push, we'll handle between one and 500 stores. We will break it down by fast movers. When we get over 100 stores in a wave, we're hoping to drive case picking, maybe even pallet picking. Now you'll have some slow movers that have to be, that have to be picked. Um, medium movers might be picked in a pick module. Fast movers might be just picked to pallet or on a pick to belt system. Um, they all would come into a wave buffer. Reason being, when we're doing a high volume operation, 20, 40, 50,000 units and up, well over 100,000, we'll use a unit sorter. The unit sorter is a pump. And as you know, you have to keep your pump primed. The wave buffer allows pickers to continually pick, but maybe even inconsistently, so that we can always deliver a, a completed full wave to the unit sorter. That unit sorter needs to stay busy 100% of your operating day when you're operate, you know, when you're shipping 100,000 units. That's the way to maximize the capacity of your automation. If you don't have a buffer, you have you either are double picking way ahead and double handling, or you may have gaps in your feed capacity to the sorter. Okay, retail in a pull methodology for low, low volume operations. Best way to pick low volume is discrete order picking. Low volume is 500 to 2,000 orders a day. Now, even though we're going to pick discrete orders, we still would like to pick multiple discrete orders at a time. Usually that's done with a cart. Reason why we like the cart is a cart, we can get six, on average, six to 20 orders on a batch cart. We have a client um, who ha obviously has some small cube product that they get 64 orders on a cart. The more orders you get it on a cart, the more efficient you are. In theory, you make only one path, one, one pass through your pick path and you pick this number of orders. So if it's six for the same amount of time, you get six. If you get 64 on here with just a little bit more time, you'll pick 64. So you're much more efficient. Um, if you're in the medium movers, that means you're shipping over, you're picking over 2,000 orders a day up to maybe 10,000 orders a day. Um, you may have both these methodologies if you have enough SKUs. Um, in a medium mover, 
typically we would want to pick this to a conveyor. Um, now, it depends on what your order profile is. Sometimes with just a, a, a pick and, and sequential pick, where you pick and pass to the next person next to you, um, one way to make that a little bit more efficient is to do a cluster pick. Similar to the cart, only you've got your order product on this gravity conveyor. And you normally can't get more than four to six orders at a time. In order to do this accurately, though, um, you and efficiently, you really need to do this with either voice or RF or combination of voice and, and uh, uh, scanners to make sure that you're picking, not only picking the right product, but putting it in the right order, order container. In this low to medium volume, um, we could batch pick 50 to 200 orders at a time. And we talked about this in the, um, in the push. It's very similar in the pull. Um, if you're low volume, you probably don't need a wave buffer and an automatic unit sorter. If you're in that five to 10,000 order range, depending upon the number of people you need today, that's why we draw this to go either to this manual consolidation or what we like to call an order consolidation module. Um, it's a manual put. So what we're going to do is we're going to batch pick anywhere between usually 50 to 100 orders for this type of consolidation um, into, a, into a toad or a container. Uh, they'll come from two or three different areas. They'll come over here. And we will use lights um, to direct those units to, in each one of these cubby holes, would be in a discrete order. If you're in that medium range, over 10,000, 25,000, it may make sense to use a unit sorter. In that range, you don't always need a wave buffer, but you may. Direct to consumer order picking. Here we're going to classify low, medium, and high volumes. Low volumes, obviously, is zero. doesn't get any lower than that, does it? Uh, to 2,000 2, orders per day. That, that's going to be a manual system. Um, and that generally would translate anywhere up to 8,000 units. Medium is 2,000 to 10,000 orders and 2,000 to 50,000 units. If you're at the lower end of that scale for units, you're even with a couple 5,000 orders, um, you're probably not a unit sortation candidate. You probably would want to go with this more intermediate system. Uh, the high volume is 10,000 plus orders per day. 50,000 plus units per day. We have a client that does 300,000 units per day. Um, the first thing, and, and this may make sense to you, it may not, separate your singles. Not only do you separate your single line item orders, um, you wait on your single line item orders as long as you can. Because again, volume equals efficiency. So rather than pulling your singles once an hour during the day, maybe batch them every four hours. And look at what your, your order cycle time is. If you're doing everything with paper and manually, we may be able to help you shorten that order cycle time. And you may be able to pull singles once a day. Just depends. Everyone's operation is different. In the low volume. We talked about this. You're going to pick discrete orders 
we're going to try and cluster pick them in uh, batches of four, four to six orders if you're picking discrete orders. Uh, medium to high, we'll do a pick and pass. In your medium volume, this is where we talked about these order consolidation modules. It depends on the cube of your order. But if you're shipping, you know, one point some line items or two point some line items per order, and it's a low cube product, there's a good chance we can uh, we can get a consolidation module with approximately a hundred orders in it, and then it goes down as your cube goes up. Um, but it's used to manually turn batch picks into discrete orders. You can get rates here between 200, 400, 500 units per hour per person. Um, the more of the same product that's in these donor totes, uh, the higher that rate can be. If they're all individual SKUs, um, you're in that two to four hundred an hour range. A high volume DC. Now, this is going to seem a little counterintuitive. But one way to increase the number of orders that we're picking here is to go back and look at how many orders can we consolidate at one time. Well, in a direct-to-consumer operation, if you have two lines per order, does it make sense to have only one order per shoot? And the answer is no, it does not. Typically, when you're shipping 100,000 uh, units or more a day, we'll put approximately four orders in one of these divert lanes on, the, on a unit sorter. OK? Um, Vantage is it makes turning this sorter on waves quicker. So we'll take those four orders. When they're completed, we'll put them into a tote. That tote will then be destined for, if it's an automated um, pack system, or pack, if you can automate the packing of it, it'll go through an order consolidation module. On the other side of that module is where we would put the line to do something like an auto bagger or a cold seal type of machine, okay? Reduce the number of touches. Um, if it's something that has to be packed more manually, that's where we'll use that uh, those four orders. And what we'll do is we'll have a little put system in the pack uh, on the pack table to turn those, that one tote into four orders. And the system will direct that, OK? So they will separate it, then they'll pack it, and then it'll go off to shipping. Now, if you are truly omnichannel, and you're doing high volumes, 100,000, 200,000 units a day. Um, let's say you have segregated direct-to-consumer and retail facilities. And maybe it's time you've done a, a network reorganization, whatever the reason may be for a new distribution center. This is the best opportunity, the best time, and a good opportunity to explore much higher levels of automation. What, what I'm showing you here is a basic block diagram of the blocks involved in an automated facility. Um, typically, it has a high bay 
bulk storage area. Usually this is mini load ASRS. Um, the flexibility is that you can pit, you pull product for any size order. Now there, depending upon what your order profiles look like, there could be a unit sorter in here also. But so we could be doing goods to person where there's a station and there's anywhere from four to five, possibly even six orders at a time processed by this person who doesn't leave this spot. Um, obviously, there needs to be a buffer that feeds them. The, you know, the, you, normally, there's not one of these goods to person stations. Um, five, six, eight, ten of them. There is a new technology that we've started to to use um, called a pocket system. And it looks like GOH. If you just look at the pictures, oh, that's hanging, that, that's GOH, it's just like that slick rail. Well, it looks like it, but it does not perform like it. It is essentially automated storage and retrieval at the unit level. Um, you'll see a video a little later on, but essentially what these hanging, these are bags, these are pockets, and you can, you can put hanging garments on here, but you can also put things up to about six, seven pounds, shoes, different types of hard goods, uh, flat apparel. Um, so it would allow you to store, store in bulk in an automated, automated area. A, an induction station where we come out of a tote or a carton into the, uh, the pockets. Um, you'll see the pockets allow you to pack much, much faster. So you can see, you can see operation, you can see throughputs here of between four to 650 lines an hour per one of either these stations or these stations. This station is showing you it's being fed by both skew totes or cartons and by the pocket system. I'll let you watch the video here. Um, pocket system can handle hard goods, soft goods. It was originally designed for garments on hangers. Um, you load, as you can see here, you load it automatically. It's as fast as loading anything else. Um, it's fast. You're at 10,000 uh, bags an hour per line. So it, it can be faster, than, a system could be faster than 10,000. Um, it has both. Uh, storage buffers where we can pull one product out. What you're seeing here is sequencing. So if you're doing retail um, and let's say you're doing men's garments and you know, pants and suits and you want your retail store wants the gray pants, the 36 is first and the 44 is last in the box. This system does this automatically. This system is excellent for returns. If you do not capture all of your returns because for resale because it's too much handling, this simplifies that. It simplifies it greatly. Um, all you need to do is perform the QC that you do today and you put it in one of these bags, it goes up out of the way. It's very, very easy to handle returns with this. And you can pull them out one at a time. You don't have to put multiples, multiple SKUs in a tote and then sort through them. And all of this is driven, every system is different. The thing that is common throughout all of our solutions is our software. Our WCS is, is called Shiraz. Um, it has been designed for the two industries that we're most prominent in, both um, retail or, or consumer goods and um, uh, wine and spirits. 
and it's designed to give you greater visibility. It can it can run all of all of the uh, facets of order fulfillment. Everything from work from planning and wave creation, right on through to um, um, directing all of the automated and semi-automated machinery. Um, and what we feel it does a little bit better than anything else we've seen is visibility. It can be customized to give you the visibility into those aspects of your business that are very different from everyone else. Everyone's business is unique in some way. But um, that is, I think we've run through the loop on that. Real-time communication for help and support. And then, so, we've helped you pick retail orders more efficiently. We've helped you pick direct-to-consumer or e-commerce orders more efficiently. But the first thing we talked about was ship to store. And how do you do that efficiently? It's easy, relatively easy, to pick and ship retail orders. But how do I get those direct-to-consumers on that retail truck? There's more than one way to do it. But let's assume that your direct-to-consumer orders are not things like canoes and uh, um, um, uh, surfboards. Thank you. Um, the way that you do it is you treat your direct. Let me give you an overview here. You've got separate. You you may have some separate retail picking, some separate direct to consumer picking. Most probably, there's some, if not all, overlapped out of the same picking area. They may be picked a little differently. Um, they may be packed differently. They probably will be. Um, if you're an apparel company and your direct-to-consumer orders are, um, are units, flats, we'll say, and they're one or two, um, what we find is use this sorter, and sometimes this is the same sorter handling uh, the same packing or the same shipping. But what we do is after they get after they get packed, what we'll do is the ship to stores. This sorter here has a bin for every one of the stores. So the the direct to consumer order was picked like the rest of the direct to consumer orders. It was packed the same. It was then reinducted to be sorted out by store, one store per bin. Well, when that full or that order is completed. That then is brought over to the shipping dock, and assuming that you do stage your um, retail shipments on the floor, that's brought over either in, and the product is transferred, or if there's enough of it, it could be a one-way um, 4840 Gaylord um, treated just like another pallet on the, on the shipment. Now, you know, to make sure that everything's done properly, this would be a process in your WMS, um, but it's very easily done. I'm sure many of you are saying it's not that easy, and I'm sure that it's not. Um, but everyone's challenges are a little different in this. I did want to address it, um, so I... I tried to address it <laughs> as generically as possible. Um, there's a lot more to go into in packing and shipping, and we're going to save that for the next webinar for the final portion of this series. 
almost on time. Wanted to see if anyone has any questions. We'll kind of wait a moment for everyone to gather themselves. Okay, we have a question. When would I use a put system versus a pick system? Um, well, we, we discussed it. it's kind of an inventory strategy of whether you're pushing it to the stores or whether you're um, filling their demand. Um, but regardless of the answer to that, if when you can uh, distribute a, a pick from a SKU, and I always use about 80 to 85 percent of your orders get at least one of that SKU, then it's a good candidate for a put rather than a pick. Now you may only have a small portion of SKUs that distribute, uh, that, that generate that kind of volume, but if it's across the chain of stores, um, there are ways to deal with just those high volume SKUs. Any other questions? Oh, here's a good question. What are the throughput rates of automated systems? Um, an automated system like we showed, um, the pocket system can generate approximately 10,000 pockets an hour or 10,000 units an hour. Um, a, the buffer systems can easily generate 1,000 totes an hour or more. Um, and, and what that turns into orders in the neighborhood of a goods a goods to person order fulfillment station can do between 400 and 650 orders an hour per station we are just about out of time Liz, are there any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank everyone for their time. I hope you found it uh, this informative and, and worth spending with us. We look forward to seeing you at the final, um, the final webinar in the series where we will address um, packing for an, um, in an omni-channel environment. Thank you all for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks.